Part 2 What You Should Know About the 15 Best Known Bible Versions English Revised Version ERV American Standard Version ASV 8. The Root of Modern Bibles A Movement of Doubters Today we are living in the midst of an unprecedented movement of Bible doubters. Satan keeps trying his hardest to destroy faith in the Bible in the hearts of Christian people, and he finally found a strategy that worked. How does he do this? By pushing the lie that the Bible has to be fixed and whispering, yeah, half God said. 68. Pretending there's something wrong with the Bible every time they don't understand a Bible verse. I just read a commentary by a famous Bible scholar. He didn't understand how one verse followed another, but he was too proud to say, I don't understand how this goes, but this is what I think it means. So what did he do? He blamed the Bible, saying the verse is probably affected by the corrupt text. 69. Without a shred of evidence, he made up the idea that the text was corrupt, rather than believe he didn't understand what God said. There are many Bible verses I have not understood, but that did not make God or his Bible wrong. I simply did not understand them. Think about it, it makes no sense to doubt God and his words just because we don't understand them. It is our understanding that is to blame, not God. Do you see what is happening? Satan wants you to doubt the Bible God's own words that he preserved for you. The devil has worked systematically, creating a leadership of Bible disbelievers, trying to infect your own church and destroy your own faith. 70. It isn't hard to find Bible disbelievers. Many of them are teaching right now in our Bible colleges and seminaries. The history of Bible disbelief goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. But we don't have to go that far to find the root of the modern text critical movement and modern Bibles. Let's just go back to the mid-1800s and a pair of scoundrels named Westcott and Hort. It all started with Westcott and Hort. If you read certain books today, you would think two angels named Westcott and Hort descended from heaven to hand us a better Bible, kind of like the way Joseph Smith claimed to receive the Book of Mormon and Muhammad claimed to receive the Quran. But nothing could be further from the truth. After the littlest smattering of New Testament Greek, Fenton John Anthony Hort was quickly led by his buddy Brooke Foss Westcott to books favoring biblical criticism, 71, and using the perverted Greek texts of Roman Catholic J.M.A. Scholes, of Constantine Tischendorf and others. But before he did his own research, Hort had to make a decision, would he trust his doubting teachers and so-called text-critical scholars, or would he believe his Bible? Believe it or not, he chose to dump his Bible and believe his teachers. Do you see what he did? He dropped the complete, preserved words of God and bought into the doctrinally perverted Bibles of Origen and others who didn't even believe Jesus Christ was God Almighty. The effect was almost immediate. Within weeks Hort ignorantly slandered the preserved Greek text and libelously wrote, calling it, that vile textus receptus, 72. Westcott and Hort were brainwashed by their professors into doubting the Bible almost as soon as they began working with the critical Greek New Testaments. Two years later, they devised a plan to secretly create a new Greek text from which to make a new English Bible to replace the King James. But it wasn't new. They simply cut out words they didn't want, 73, and pasted in whatever their favorite Alexandrian Greek text said, 74. So their Greek text took out hundreds of words, phrases, even whole verses that God had preserved through Bible believers over almost 2,000 years. What kind of scholarship is that? And these two guys are the fathers of the modern Bibles? Think carefully. If you cannot trust the method they used, you will not be able to trust the Bible they created either. The English Revised Version, 1881 for 19 years Hort and Westcott worked on their scheme to make a new Greek text. Their goal was for everyone to throw away the preserved Greek text behind the King James Bible and grab hold of the new one they created by picking and choosing their favorite readings out of the Alexandrian stream of manuscripts. 
In 1870, as they worked toward completion of their Greek text, they were offered the opportunity to be on the revision committee to rewrite the KJV. At last. This was their chance to change the English New Testament to match their made-up Greek. And they mostly succeeded. 75. In 1881, they released their own Greek text, complete with its own theory of textual criticism in book form. 76. The next week, they released the English Revised Version New Testament. It was quite a package deal. They sold the public a vastly changed Bible with scores of important words, phrases and verses missing, and backed it up with their own new Greek text and introduction book to textual criticism. Why was a Unitarian on the Revision Committee? Unitarians do not believe Jesus is who he says he is, the only begotten Son of God, and himself the everlasting God, just as much as his Father. A Unitarian also refuses to believe that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost are together the one eternal God. Alexandrians didn't believe in Jesus' eternality and divinity either. Their scholars and scribes chipped away words from important verses that talked about the Lord Jesus being God. As they did, they cut out one of the most important verses on the Godhead from their Bibles, 1 John 5 verse 7. This is nothing but sinful, wishful thinking on their part. You see, if Jesus wasn't really God Almighty, they wouldn't have to take his words so seriously or believe his clearly stated promise to preserve his words. 77. Then they could change or reinterpret the scriptures however they wanted, whatever made them happy in their sin. This is what they did. And brothers and sisters, this was exactly what God said they would do. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. 78. So are you really surprised that Hort insisted that his English Revised Version Committee have a Unitarian on board? Hort actually complained about the moral damage that would have been done to the acceptance of the revision by the laity, non-ministers, if Unitarians had been outlawed as such. 79. Hort also thrilled over the weight of acceptance won beforehand for the revision by the single fact of our welcoming in Unitarian, 80. Look at these two comments carefully. It wouldn't be moral damage to keep Christ-denying Unitarians out of the revision committee. It was their Christian duty. And wait a minute, how did the revised version win acceptance even before it was written? Hort said it was because of their welcoming in Unitarian. But why would scholars like a Bible better if one translator rejected the Trinity and Christ's eternal Godhood? That's easy. Because some of the heretics who created the whole false science of biblical criticism that rejected God's preserved words were themselves Unitarians. 81. Doesn't that make you suspicious about what those Bible revisers really believed? It sure woke me up. What was different about the English Revised Version? Look what the ERV started. It was the first major English Bible to destroy the mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy 3 verse 16 by removing God at the right spot. The real Bible states that God was manifest in the flesh. But the Alexandrian and Roman Catholic Bibles remove God and say who was manifested in the flesh. By removing one word, they removed the Godhood of Christ out of the verse. The ERV was the first major English Bible to remove 1 John 5 verse 7, taking away the Godhead. By removing those words, they removed the unity of the Father, the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost as one God. The ERV was the first major English Bible to remove Acts 8 verse 37, the only verse that says one must believe before one can be baptized. See chapter 3. The ERV sneakily changed 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 from the clear and understandable all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. To every scripture inspired of God is also profitable. What did the revisers mean by that? Only those scriptures they accepted as inspired were profitable. They saw all the rest, like the Kings, Chronicles, other historical writings and even the Prophets, as written by good men, but not inspired by God, 82. This is just one of many examples of doctrines changed by a single word, 83. 
Out of the scripture selections in chapter 17, the ERV is missing 217 important words, phrases, and whole verses that God carefully preserved. So the ERV became the hole in the dam, opening a flood of corrupt Bibles that was about to burst upon the Protestant and Baptist world. The ERV was a setup from the beginning. Three friends, Westcott, Hort, and Lightfoot, agreed in advance on what they wanted, 84, then they pushed the others to accept it. Carefully, page by page, Westcott and Hort submitted their Alexandrian Greek readings on pieces of paper to the revision committee. And they used their reputation as Greek scholars to get the others to vote on using their readings and reject God's historically preserved words. Westcott even sulked when he didn't get what he wanted. Westcott's friend Bishop Ellicott, who sat on the revision committee, recalled how Westcott when one of his renderings was rejected would retire with a look of solemn resignation on his face as if his life work had been destroyed at a stroke. When the revision company was equally divided on some nice point of translation, Westcott always found it difficult to vote on either side, generally he preferred to withdraw to a corner of the room until the vote had been taken. 85. In the end, Satan made sure that enough of Hort and Westcott's text got in that it was no longer God's preserved words, just man's opinions. The ERV was a critical success. That means it didn't sell well, except among Bible critics. But that didn't matter. The damage was done. The English Revised Version, ERV, became the root of the modern English Bibles. The American Standard Version, 1901. The revision actually had two committees, not just one. Both English and American committees worked on the counterfeit Bible. They disagreed on quite a number of issues. But they agreed on one thing, each group would get a turn at putting together a Bible version for its country. The English Revised Version was printed by Oxford and Cambridge Presses in two parts, the New Testament in 1881 and the whole Bible in 1885. In the ERV, the main American objections were usually printed in the back of each testament. But in 1901, the Americans got their turn. Their version was printed by Thomas Nelson and Sons, 86, and became known as the American Standard Version, ASV. The ASV was also a critical success. You guessed it. Only the Bible critics and a few liberal churches loved it. But it became the root of many new American Bibles. What happened after? Westcott and Hort. After the deaths of Hort, 1892, and Westcott, 1901, their Bible continued to change. At first, various American publishers violated British copyright law, printing their own ERV-like Bibles, tailor-making them for American audiences. In 1928, the International Council of Religious Education, afraid they'd lose money if the same thing happened to the ASV, bought its copyright from Thomas Nelson. But it was no use. Though universities and seminaries loved to use the English Revised Version or American Standard Version, the common people still clung to the familiar and preserved words in English, the King James Bible. But suddenly the winds started to shift. 9. The Bible Becomes Ecumenical Revised Standard Version, RSV New Revised Standard Version, NRS English Standard Version, ESV can't we all just get along? In the early 1900s, Protestant theologians got the crazy idea that they could make the earth into God's kingdom if only the Christian denominations could get along with each other. As an end times doctrine, this is called postmillennialism, and it's as old as the Roman Catholic system. As a doctrine of the church, it's called ecumenism, a horribly deceptive beast of a doctrine. Ecumenism pretends that you can leave your beliefs at the door and get together just as Christians, and everything will be fine. But that is never true. Someone's doctrine always wins out. And usually, in one form or another, everyone compromises in favor of the Roman Catholic religion. Guess what happens when ecumenically-minded people decide to come up with a Bible version? Disaster. Chaos. Whatever you call it, one thing you can be sure of, it is nothing like God's preserved words. One of these ecumenical groups was called the International Council of Religious Education, ICRE. 
They knew that the ERV and ASV 87 hardly sold at all outside of liberal seminaries and universities. But they wanted to make a Bible they could sell to the general public at least to the people who went to their liberal churches. So in 1928, they got the copyright for the ASV from Thomas Nelson and Sons. They had decided to make a new translation in 1932, but were stopped cold by the Great Depression. In 1937, they were able to start again, and they got together 32 big-name Bible scholars like James Moffat and Edgar Goodspeed, each of whom had been making their own Bibles, 88, and well-known Jewish translator Harry Orlinsky, 89. The Revised Standard Version, 1946 to 52. By 1950, the ICRE and the Federal Council of Churches (FCC) had merged into a new group the National Council of the Churches of Christ in the USA, NCC. Two years later, the Revised Standard Version was released on an unsuspecting public. Here are a few surprising points about the RSV. Out of the 40 Bible versions investigated for this book, the Revised Standard is the second worst. The English Revised Version and American Standard Version were bad enough, removing God's words 217 times in my small sample, but the Revised Standard was far worse, removing God's words in 245 out of 257 scripture selections. See for yourself in chapter 17. It's one of only three Bibles to completely remove, 90, the important words of the angel in Luke 24 verse 6 he is not here, but is risen. It's one of only five Bibles to remove this crucial historical detail after Jesus' resurrection in Luke 24 verse 40, and when he had thus spoken, he shooed them his hands and his feet. It's one of only four Bibles to completely remove Matthew 12 verse 47. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. It's one of only three Bibles to completely remove Luke 24 verse 12. Then arose Peter, and ran unto the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. This is the only corroborating testimony to John 20 verses 4-5 to regarding Peter going to the tomb after Jesus' resurrection. Don't be fooled. Repetition is important. It's one of only two Bibles, 91, to completely remove Luke 22 verses 43-44. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. We've all heard the term, the agony in the garden? Well, without these verses, there is no agony. This is the only place in the Bible that reveals the agony Jesus suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane. It is the only place in the Bible to tell us about his sweat like blood. It is also the only place in the Bible that tells about the angel who strengthened Jesus in the garden, like the angels who ministered unto him after his three temptations at the beginning of his ministry, 92. The RSV removes words, phrases, and whole verses in 245 of our 257 sample verses. By contrast, the ERV and ASV remove 217. So the RSV removed over 10% more words, phrases, and verses than Westcott and Hort could convince the committee to do with the ERV and ASV. The RSV even removed eight more words and phrases than the Jehovah's Witnesses did in their New World Translation. The RSV is not just a revised King James at all, is it? How ecumenical was the RSV? Roman Catholic leadership does not permit Catholics to read a book or Bible unless it has the Nihil Obstat and slash or imprimatur on its copyright page. Nihil Obstat means nothing stands in the way or contradicts the basic Roman Catholic doctrines of popery, idolatry, worship of Mary, earning salvation through works, etc. Imprimatur means let it be printed. Catholic leadership declares the book is considered free from error in matters of Roman Catholic doctrine and morals, and Catholics are then allowed to read it. If a publisher can get the Nihil Obstat and Imprimatur, that can be big money in the bank. You see, compromise seems to pay at first. So the National Council of Churches, NCC, went after and got that Roman Catholic endorsement. 
Here are the results. 1957, RSV Apocrypha and Catholic Deuterocanonical, 93, books published. 1965, RSV New Testament, Catholic Edition, printed by Thomas Nelson and Sons. 1966, RSV Bible, Catholic Edition. It arranged the Deuterocanonical books in traditional Catholic order, like the so-called Septuagint. 94. 2006, RSV Bible, Second Catholic Edition, also called the Ignatius Edition. But they didn't just pass off the Catholic RSV on Roman Catholics. At the same time, they tried to push Protestants to accept the apocryphal and deuterocanonical books. See for yourself. 1965, RSV Oxford Annotated Bible with the Apocrypha. It put the Apocrypha at the end of the Bible, after Revelation, between the Bible Helps and the Map section. 1973, RSV Common Bible, an ecumenical edition, with the Apocrypha slash Deuterocanonical books. It tried to please both Roman Catholics and Greek Orthodox leaders by getting endorsements from their leaders. It also moved the Apocrypha and Deuterocanonical books between the Testaments like the early KJVs did. But unlike the KJV, they didn't clearly label each page Apocrypha to separate it from the inspired books. 1977, Oxford Annotated Apocrypha, Expanded Edition. It added 3rd and 4th Maccabees and Psalm 151, used by the Greek Orthodox, to its other apocryphal books. Can there be any doubt of the RSV's march toward Rome? But the dysfunctional Revised Standard family has more than just this. The New Revised Standard Version 1989 One problem when you start changing the Bible, you don't know where to stop. Back in 1990, as a seminary graduate and budding linguist, I was so excited when I read about the publication of the New Revised Standard Version, NRS. As soon as I read the news article, my wife and I drove down to the nearest Bible bookstore and bought one. At last. A Bible produced by no less than the famous Greek scholar, Bruce Metzger. Many of my Greek helps in Bible college and seminary had been co-written by him and so were my Greek New Testaments. The NRS incorporated all the principles of textual criticism we had been taught, and it read very smoothly, just like the kind of Bible my wife and I wanted to make as future Bible translators. But oh, boy, something was missing. Amazingly, though I tried to put my heart into those words, somehow they came out flat. It was strange. Has someone ever said something to you, and your clear, gut reaction was, that's wrong, but you could not put your finger on exactly where? That was how I felt. I'm ashamed to admit it, but my spiritual life dwindled during the time I tried to read that version. I wrote in my journal at the time that this Bible was spiritually dead for me. But for the life of me, I could not figure out what was wrong. But now I can tell you what was wrong. They weren't God's words. It wasn't God's text. And it wasn't God's translation. The Bible didn't say the same thing anymore. It was just the opinions of man written down and passed off as a Bible. Want a glimpse at what is wrong with the New Revised Standard Version? Let's have a look. A lot of hell is missing. There are 54 verses in the KJV containing the word hell. In all but 13, the NRS takes out hell and leaves in the untranslated Hebrew word Sheol or the Greek word Hades. Jesus was unafraid to talk about hell. He talked about hell a lot. What are these guys afraid of? Is it any surprise that they also removed words about hell and judgment from Mark 6 verse 11 and 945 and completely removed Matthew 21 44, 23 14, Mark 9 verse 44 and 46, 95, there's something about hell that makes these people very nervous. The prophetic nature of Isaiah 7 verse 14 is missing. This verse prophesies of a virgin bearing a child who will be God with us. God helped Matthew understand this perfectly. Read Matthew 1 verse 23. But the NRS, as the RSV before it, removed virgin and put young woman to remove the prophecy. The double brackets trick, the NRS includes Mark 16 verses 9 to 20 and John 7 53 to 8 11, but with a twist there in double brackets.
The footnote for John 7:53 to 8:11 claims this episode not found in the most authoritative manuscripts. The footnote 96 for Mark 16 verses 9 to 20 piles on more doubt, claiming that these verses were possibly written in the early 2nd century and appended to the gospel later in the 2nd century. They're not trying to explain scripture, they're trying to explain it away. From our sample, the NRS is missing seven less words, phrases, and verses than the RSV. Big deal. It still perverts 238 instead of 245-1 more than the Jehovah's Witnesses New World Translation, NWT. Even without a nihil obstat or imprimatur, the NRSV with Apocrypha has been welcomed and used by Roman Catholics. Check out required Bible texts at major Catholic universities. You will find the NRSV with Apocrypha alongside the Roman Catholic, New American, Jerusalem and New Jerusalem Bibles. It has also been required for courses at mainline Lutheran, Anglican, Presbyterian and Methodist universities. The fact that it was the first attempt at a gender-neutral Bible helped sway those liberal Protestants as well. Yes, indeed, the NRS clearly appeals to an ecumenical spirit. How do you make an ecumenical Bible? You work hard to remove and rewrite anything that makes people feel uncomfortable. That is not easy. A lot of scriptures make people uncomfortable. It took them years, but the National Council of Churches eventually got their wish. The NRS became the first truly ecumenical Bible. Why did they work so hard? because these guys were desperate to make a Bible in their own image that would tone down the gospel and hide the doctrines they hated most that the King James stated so clearly. So their Bible pleased almost everybody, their friends, Bible doubters the world over, lukewarm Christians, even the devil himself, but not God. The English Standard Version 2001, the English Standard Version, ESV, was a totally different Bible from the RSV and NRS or so they tell us. The ESV claims to walk the tightrope between Bible versions. For one thing, it claims to be more literal than the NIV but less literal than the New American Standard. It removes most, but not all, of the gender-neutral language found in the NRS and today's NIV, TNIV. And it puts back most of the words of Old Testament prophecies that the RSV and NRS perverted to hide their being fulfilled by Jesus Christ in the New Testament, 97. How different is the ESV? Beyond the plastic surgery, is the ESV really that different from the RSV, NRS, and other Alexandrian Bibles? According to our sample, the ESV is missing only four less words, phrases, or verses than the NRS. That means they're still 98% the same. Not much of a difference, is it? Remember those missing words you read about in chapters 1, 2, 3, and 6? Check again. They're missing from the ESV, the same as the RSV, NRS, and other Alexandrian Bibles. All but one of its 234 missing words, phrases, and verses from our sample is also missing from either the RSV or NRS, 98. So while the translation of some of the words may be different in the ESV, it is clear that the text is just as perverted as the other Alexandrian Bibles. See for yourself. Chapter 17 checks 40 Bible versions against the King James Bible, showing 257 verses perverted by missing words or phrases, or just missing entirely. Check them out for yourself in any version, and keep a King James Bible handy so you can see the difference. Then ask yourself, which Bible promotes faith in God the Father, in the Lord Jesus Christ His Son, and in the Holy Ghost? And notice how the other Bibles raise doubts in your heart. You will see for yourself why I trust God's words in the King James Bible. 10. If it looks like a duck, the New American Standard Version, NAS. New American Standard 1995 Update, NAU. My story. On August 24, 1980, I repented of my sins and won the victory. Back then I had two Bibles, a Lamsa Bible, 99, a popular seller in the occultic churches, 100, and a gigantic, mule-choking King James Family Tree Bible. 
I quickly abandoned the Lamsa and faithfully read my King James daily, starting in both Genesis and Matthew. As big as it was, I knew where my faith lay, and I carried that book with me everywhere. A well-meaning friend who had talked to me about Christ wanted to relieve me of some of my burden. So, after, I was baptized in October of that year, he gave me a gift, a beautiful, brand new, smaller, easier to hold Bible. I was so excited. Then I looked at the cover, New American Standard. What is that? It's more literal, and it's easier to understand than your other Bible. Though neither of us knew it at the time, my new Bible started me down the path of doubt that this Bible or any other on earth could actually be God's words. Let me tell you how it happened. As a newly baptized, repentant believer, I longed to understand my new Bible better, so I bought a genuine leather Ryrie study Bible, New American Standard. I loved my Ryrie. I read all the study notes, outlines, and indexes faithfully. A few months later, I started going to Bible college. I was on a high, but everything started going downhill after I got my Ryrie. Here's why. Ryrie's notes often corrected the New American Standard, offering a better translation. That made it hard to know which to trust, Ryrie or the New American Standard. At one point, I grabbed a Ryrie KJV to see if he liked that translation any better. No way. Ryrie disagreed even more with the KJV, so I stuck with my NAS and pressed on. When I got to Bible college, one of the first things my professors basically said was, God's words are perfect, but he entrusted his words to imperfect men. Those words are in writings called the original autographs. Then men made copies of God's inspired words. But because men aren't perfect, lots of mistakes crept in. But don't worry, the original autographs are perfect and inspired and have no errors. The only thing is, they don't exist anymore. But have no fear, because of the great work of textual scholars of ancient Alexandria and brilliant men from the 1800s to the present, the text that you now have is certified 99 and 44 slash 100% pure. Besides, all Bibles, even the worst copies, are 99% the same. Oh, there were so many questions in my head I should have asked. But come on, who was I? I was just a new believer, as they called me. I was at a disadvantage. I wasn't raised as a Christian like all these other guys. I wasn't trained up like these professors. I figured I was just ignorant or missing something, so I kept my questions to myself. But they didn't go away. Here are some of them. If only the original autographs are inspired, why didn't God just keep them on earth? People said that we would commit bibliolatry and worship the Bible, but that's a flimsy excuse to me. God had the power to inspire his written words. Couldn't he keep them on earth if they're the only way we can learn the complete truth about God, faith, salvation, heaven, and hell? If no one has the original autographs to check, then how can we know that what we have is 99 and 44 slash 100% pure? What if all we have are lousy copies? If no one has the original autographs, how can we know we have all the books of the Bible? Or how can we know we don't have one book too many? If all the versions of the Bible are basically the same, why did people hate the King James Bible so much? Even though one version completely disagreed with another, we were taught to weigh the Bibles against each other and come to our own understanding of what we thought each verse said. But there was a catch. Wherever it led us was fine, as long as it wasn't to the King James Bible. I had so many conflicts in my mind that first semester that I came close to flunking out of every class. But in the fall semester, I returned dedicated to be a good student and studied my heart out. I learned that we please our professors by spouting the party line, and pleasing our professors was how we got good grades. But even though I knew all this, soon I was hooked. I did believe my professors. I became a true believer in my favorite teachers, just like other A students. Over the years, I moved from the NAS to the ASV, RSV, NEB, NJB, and NIV, but I was determined never to trust the KJV. All Bibles are pretty much as good as one another, except the King James. 
Never again would I simply take any Bible at its word. Instead, I carried around a backpack full of Greek study helps and Bible versions in English, Greek, and Hebrew. When I did Bible study in the New Testament, it got to where I investigated every word, weighing the authority of each ancient text, before I would tentatively believe I understood a single verse of the Bible. Brothers and sisters, that's not faith. That is doubt, pure and simple. I have not found a single Bible verse that says we are blessed for doubting God. Years later, another caring Christian asked some very good questions that sent me on a search for the truth. And within a decade, I was forced to admit from the evidence that God had preserved his words through history 101, and those preserved words in English are the King James Bible, the same Bible I had started with back in 1980. Now when I walk around, I don't need a backpack anymore. I just carry God's preserved words in English, the King James Bible, and I know I can believe every word. It took 18 years to undo the work of that one well-meaning Christian. Let this be an example to you, the next time you feel tempted to make it easier on a new believer in Christ by giving him or her a corrupted Bible. The NASB, another Bible built, upon a faulty foundation. Some of the greatest evils have started with the best of intentions. Famous pastor and speaker S. Franklin Logsdon had been friends for years with a well-intentioned businessman, F. Dewey Lockman, founder of the Lockman Foundation. Lockman wanted gospel literature and the scriptures distributed to the far corners of the world. With that in mind, he felt he needed to publish the most accurate Bible he could. That's a wonderful goal. But you should never build a house on a foundation of sand, 102, and Dewey Lockman started with a faulty foundation. Listening to the so-called scholarship of the day, he abandoned the King James, God's preserved words for the corrupt words of Westcott and Hort in English the American Standard Version, ASV 1901.103. In 1956-57 his friend Frank Logston did a feasibility study and interviewed translators to see if it would be a good idea to make a new American Standard. Logston even wrote the preface in his enthusiasm. But in the months and years that followed its 1971 publication, Logston came to realize he had made a terrible mistake. Over the next years, Logston spoke to churches and wrote to individuals, warning them with these and other words. I'm afraid I'm in trouble with the Lord because I encouraged him, Lockman, to go ahead with it, the new American standard. I must under God renounce every attachment to the new American standard. The devil is too wise to try to destroy the Bible. He can't destroy the word of God. But he can do a lot of things to try to supplant it or to corrupt it in the minds and hearts of God's people. Now he can only do it in one of two ways, either by adding to the scriptures or by subtracting from the scriptures. The deletions are absolutely frightening. Lockman and the translators of the NAS began the project with good intentions. Frank Logsdon wrote, I can aver, declare to be true, that the project was produced by thoroughly sincere men who had the best of intentions. The product, however, is grievous to my heart and helps to complicate matters in these already troublous times. 104. These men were sincere, but they were sincerely wrong. Why? Because they started with a faulty foundation, the Alexandrian Greek New Testament, the Westcott and Hort English New Testament, and the falsely called science of textual criticism, 105. What's missing from the New American Standard? Just from my sample of verses in chapter 17, and this is by no means exhaustive, in the New American Standard. Lord is missing 15 times. Jesus is missing nine times. Christ is missing 30 times. Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus is missing four times. Lord Jesus Christ is missing three times. People not raised on the KJV are growing to doubt that Jesus Christ is God, that Christ Lord and even the clear Bible doctrine that he is the only way to heaven. 106, you cannot deny it. The devil's plan is working. Remember this, Satan doesn't want every word omitted, it would be too obvious. Instead, he wants to fuel your doubts about the doctrines of the verses that are left. 
As Frank Logston put it, it is done so subtly that very few would discover it. Does it work? The proof is all around you. Look at the church today. What doctrines are more evangelicals and others having the greatest problems believing? They are the very doctrines that Satan meant to chip away at by taking out words, phrases, and verses in ancient Alexandrian and modern Bibles. Here are some more examples from our sampling of verses. In Luke 4 verse 8, Jesus' command to the devil, Get thee behind me, Satan, is missing. In Mark 9 verse 29, Acts 10 verse 30 and 1 Corinthians 7 verse 5 fasting is missing. In Matthew 17 verse 21, prayer and fasting are both missing, 107. Hell has almost disappeared, reduced from 54 verses to only 15. Words from Mark 9 verse 45 and all of 9 44 and 46, where Christ repeated himself in exclaiming the dangers of hell, have been removed as well. Is it any wonder that doctrines about Satan, prayer, fasting, and the existence and nature of hell are questioned and doubted by modern preachers, teachers, and youth? In Luke 24 verse 51, the statement about Jesus' ascension and was carried up into heaven is missing. But Luke himself, by the inspiration of God, told us he wrote these words. In Acts 1 verses 1 to 2 Luke wrote, The former treatise have I made, referring to the Gospel of Luke, of all that Jesus began both do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up. How could God make it more obvious that these words belong? But the NAS translators trusted Westcott and Hort and their textual criticism, relying on one of their favorite texts, Codex Sinaiticus even though almost every other manuscript in the world has those words. Should we trust these scholars? or what God has preserved. Brackets in the New American Standard. As you saw in chapter 4, there are no brackets in the King James Bible. Every word was placed in it with care because the translators believed those were the very words of God, translated accurately into English. But in the New American Standard, brackets have a sneaky aim. This is how the NAS describes its use of brackets. Brackets in the text are around words probably not in the original writings, 108. In other words, the NAS translators put brackets when they did not believe the words they put in their Bible. What does that do to your faith in those words? How would you ever believe what they say is true? Inside the first bracket, they put a one to make you look at their margin, one, then the margin says this, one many manuscripts. Do not contain this V. This is short for many manuscripts do not contain this verse. It looks like they want you to disbelieve those words, even though they are God's words, contained in preserved Bibles throughout history. Out of the 47 verses in which brackets are found in my small sample, 41 of the 47 are whole verses. So they didn't believe those 41 verses, yet they put them in their Bible so you would buy their book. How dishonest can you get? In Bible college, I was told over and over again, the New American Standard is the conservative Christian response to the Revised Standard Version. But is the NAS more conservative? Out of our sample, it perverts seven less verses than the RSV, but that's still 238 out of 257 perverted verses identical to the number perverted in the New Revised Standard. That's hardly what I would call conservative. But they took another try at it in 1995. Did it get any better? The New American Standard 1995 Update Why was an update done to the New American Standard? What changed? Well, in this book we want to focus on what is missing. 109, so let's compare. The NAU's missing words, phrases, and verses affect six less verses than the NAS. But that is still 232 out of the 257 selected verses. Here are the verses the NAU tried to fix to remove obvious NAS errors frowny face 110. In Luke 24 verse 36, it put back Jesus' words and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. In Mark 14 verse 68, it put back the historical fact and the cock crew. It put back the whole verse of Luke 24 verse 12 about Peter visiting the sepulcher. In the NAS, it was in brackets. It put back the whole verse of Luke 24 verse 40 about Jesus showing his hands and feet. 
In the NAS, they were in brackets and had the note, many manuscripts do not contain this V. But in the NAU, the note was completely removed. So what happened to those many manuscripts they thought were so important before? It fixed their embarrassing removal of the ascension of Jesus and was carried up into heaven in Luke 24 verse 51, and again they took away the negative note. In Colossians 3 verse 6, it put back that the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience and changed the note from some early manuscripts. Have it to the more honest two early manuscripts. Do not contain the words. So only six of our sample verses are actually different in the NAU, but 232 of them are just as bad as the NAS. How different is it, really? Every one of those changes was something the King James Bible already said. So which are you going to trust, a Bible that needs change or one that has never changed? I don't want to be fooled by so-called scholarship twice. I'm sticking with God's preserved words in English, the King James Bible. The next time someone says the New American Standard is a conservative or perfectly acceptable translation, remember how it removes more of God's words than almost all the other translations. In our list, it's number four, almost as bad as the liberal RSV and just as bad as the NRS. Remember that old saying, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. 11. The International Bibles. New International Version, NIV. Today's NIV, TNIV. New International Reader's Version, NIRV. Something for nothing? I attended Bible College from 1981 to 1984. During that time, there was a kind of handout that happened at the beginning of every school year. Somewhere near the classrooms would be a guy handing out brand new, full size, large margin, for notes, hardcover NIV Bibles for free. Who could resist an offer like that? The only thing missing were the maps in the back, but we didn't care. Make something free and college students will climb through sewer grates to grab it. Of course, you know how it goes. The first one's free, but the next one's gonna cost you. Once professors started using the NIV, probably starting with free copies like us, we had to have other study helps using the NIV as well. For years, the KJV was the only game in town. To search the entire Bible, you needed either a Strong's or Young's Concordance to find every word. But the NAS was starting to make its own concordance, and the NIV people were quickly on the move. Before I saw what was happening, I was shelling out big bucks for costly books like the NIV Greek-English Interlinear New Testament, the NIV Hebrew-English Interlinear Old Testament, all four volumes. The NIV Study Bible. Other study helps because they use the NIV as well. I actually bought an NIV Greek English Interlinear New Testament for my wife for the anniversary of our engagement. The bookstore clerk said, that's not very romantic. I responded, to Deb it is. Okay, so it wasn't a typical romance, but you get the idea. Later on, with the money I got for tutoring Greek, I bought 25 NIV Bibles to give away. With other money, I bought NIV Study Bibles and the Lutheran's Concordia NIV Self-Study Bibles to give to friends. All right, I was a sucker, but a well-intentioned one. Those free Bibles must have cost them mega bucks. The NIV publishers sure invested in us Bible college students. But we should have realized that you never get something for nothing. Everything costs. As time went on, we heard about other colleges that got the same free Bibles. But in the end, that huge investment by the publishers sure paid off. The NIV became one of the most purchased Bibles in the world. Something for everyone? It's called the New International Version for a reason. According to the preface in my free NIV 111, it started in 1965 after some committees from the Christian Reformed Church and the National Association of Evangelicals decided a totally new translation was necessary. That they were from many denominations, including Anglican, Assemblies of God, Baptist, Brethren, Christian Reformed, Church of Christ, Evangelical Free, Lutheran, Mennonite, Methodist, Nazarene, Presbyterian, 
Wesleyan and other churches helped to safeguard the translation from sectarian bias. Our denomination was in the list. It must be good, right? But that's not all. The fact that participants from the United States, Great Britain, Canada, Australia and New Zealand worked together gave the project its international scope. Yes, brothers and sisters. It was scholarly, too. In 1967 the New York Bible Society, now the New York International Bible Society, generously undertook the financial sponsorship of the project, a sponsorship that made it possible to enlist the help of many distinguished scholars. I want you to note something very important. All this involved many thousands of hours of research and discussion regarding the meaning of the texts and the precise way of putting them into English. It may well be that no other translation has been made by a more thorough process of review and revision from committee to committee than this one. When I show you words that are missing from the NIV that are clearly in God's preserved Bibles throughout history a couple of which are in every single manuscript I can find, including the Alexandrian ones I want you to remember that every word in the NIV was put there intentionally, with a great deal of thought. There you have it. It is transdenominational, international, and scholarly. It's got something for everyone. What more could anyone want in a Bible version? What I want is what God actually said. So let's see how the NIV measured up. Something is missing. To say something is missing from the NIV is an understatement. Of the 40 Bibles investigated for this book and based on my sample of 257 verses, the NIV is missing more words, phrases, and whole verses than any other Bible version. The NIV tops the list with 246 out of 257 verses perverted by deleting God's holy and preserved words. It's always important when you remove a word that God intended to be in the Bible. But there is no reason to remove the simple and obvious name Jesus from these verses. See for yourself. Matthew 17 verse 22 And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. Mark 14 verse 18 And as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. First, these verses are so obviously about Jesus that a three-year-old with a good attention span could see that. Second, every Greek manuscript in the known universe contains the Lord's name Jesus. So why did they take it out? The NIV bragged about its scholars and attention to detail. Did one of them think the style was better by removing what God had placed there? None of 38 other Bible versions removed the Lord's name there. What gave them the gall to do this? This may seem like such a tiny thing. It took me a lot of hours of intense study to even find it. But there it is. And it shows you an attitude. If they are willing, without remorse, to take out something that exists in every single Greek text, what more of God's words are they willing to remove? The clear answer is, a lot. It also removes the Lord from Luke 17 verse 6, present in every Greek manuscript. In 1 Corinthians 9 verse 18, the NIV and three other versions not only remove that it is the gospel of Christ, but also delete the second and third times Paul repeated gospel in that verse, though it is present in every Greek manuscript. Sixteen whole verses are completely missing. The only... What? The fact that Jesus is God's only begotten Son is removed from the NIV New Testament. Yet they use the term in Isaiah 45 verse 10 without apology. This term is important. We are adopted sons, but we are not begotten. Only Jesus was begotten of God the Father. That is one way we describe how He is God and we are not. So it is no minor thing that the NIV led the pack in dropping this important word and taking away this vital doctrine of God the Son along with it. What is their problem with Jesus? The NIV can't seem to decide who He is. In 1978 John 1 verse 18 said Jesus was God the only Son. By 1984, he became God the one and only. But both are wrong. Jesus is the only begotten Son, just like it says in the King James Bible and the vast majority of ancient Greek manuscripts. The NIV eliminates a number of other vital things about our Lord Jesus Christ. 
It eliminates that he was Mary's firstborn son in Matthew 1 verse 25. It eliminates that he is the beginning and the ending in Revelation 1 verse 8. It eliminates that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last in Revelation 1 verse 11. It eliminates an art to come, part of the future nature of Christ in Revelation 11 verse 17. It eliminates that our belief must be on me, on Jesus, to have everlasting life in John 6 verse 47. It completely removes Acts 8 verse 37, the only verse in the Bible that says what one must do before he can be baptized believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. See chapter 2. It completely removes from Matthew 9 verse 13 and Mark 2 verse 17 what Jesus Christ came to call sinners to do, he came to call them to repentance. It completely removes Mark 15 verse 28, the only place in the Bible that states how Jesus fulfilled Isaiah 53 verse 12. All sorts of historical details concerning the life of Christ and the early church are omitted from the NIV as well. Are we really going to trust these committees against the entire history of God's preserved words? Do we want to take that chance with God? Chapter 17 is filled with verses that have been perverted or removed entirely by the NIV and 39 other Bibles. As you will see for yourself, the NIV appears on the list more than any other Bible version. Take a close look at what this Bible and the others listed are missing. Do you think that with all those words, phrases, and verses missing, none of them is important, none of them is about an important doctrine? That's what professors and even some preachers have been telling us. But as for me, I'll trust what God revealed and preserved for thousands of years over any scholar, any day, as he himself revealed through the psalmist. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. 112. Today's Neve, a sneaky way. To keep a promise. In 1997, it was revealed that the International Bible Society, IBS, in Britain had quietly copyrighted an inclusive language edition of the NIV back in 1995. This version removed and changed gender words such as man, father, son, he, she, etc. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 15 verse 21, for example. KJV for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. The first man is Adam. The second man is Christ Jesus. Nivi and TNIV, for since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a human being. What possible reason could there be for removing the fact that Adam and Christ were both men? This was done simply to make the Bible more inclusive of the feminine gender, even in places where the Greek and Hebrew clearly are masculine. Quickly, the Southern Baptist Convention, James Dobson and others who used the NIV openly criticized this proposed change. Seventeen is filled with verses that have been perverted or removed entirely by the NIV and 39 other Bibles. As you will see for yourself, the NIV appears on the list more than any other Bible version. Take a close look at what this Bible and the others listed are missing. Do you think that with all those words, phrases, and verses missing, none of them is important, none of them is about an important doctrine? That's what professors and even some preachers have been telling us. But as for me, I'll trust what God revealed and preserved for thousands of years over any scholar, any day, as he himself revealed through the psalmist. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. 112. Today's Neve, a sneaky way. To keep a promise. In 1997, it was revealed that the International Bible Society, IBS, in Britain had quietly copyrighted an inclusive language edition of the NIV back in 1995. This version removed and changed gender words such as man, 
father, son, he, she, etc. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 15 verse 21, for example, KJV for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. The first man is Adam. The second man is Christ Jesus. Nivi and TNIV, for since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a human being. What possible reason could there be for removing the fact that Adam and Christ were both men? This was done simply to make the Bible more inclusive of the feminine gender, even in places where the Greek and Hebrew clearly are masculine. Quickly, the Southern Baptist Convention, James Dobson and others who used the NIV openly criticized this proposed change. On May 27, the IBS claimed they would stop all consideration of gender-related changes to the NIV, stating in a press conference, IBS has abandoned all plans for gender-related changes in future editions of the new international version, NIV. The present, 1984, NIV text will continue to be published. There are no plans for a further revised edition. IBS will begin immediately to revise the new International Reader's Version, NIRV, in a way that reflects the treatment of gender in the NIV. IBS is directing the licensees who publish the current NIRV to publish only the revised NIRV edition as soon as it is ready. IBS will enter into negotiations with the publisher of the NIV in the UK on the matter of ceasing publication of its inclusive language edition of the NIV. History shows they kept their promise, well, sort of. By May of 1999, the IBS and its Committee on Bible Translation, CBT, announced it would keep working and possibly produce a new English translation, but not call the NIV. In June, a previously unreleased letter from 1999 revealed that they fully supported gender-accurate language, stating, the matter is one of timing, of finding the appropriate hour to move ahead. 113, in a few days another article appeared, 114, reporting this Bible was due to be published in 2003 or 2004. It pointed out, it will not be called the NIV, but will have a similar name. The style and character will remain the same. As the NIV, the Committee on Bible Translation, CBT, that originally translated the NIV would do the research on the wording of this new version. So, in fits and starts, with accusations and denials, somewhere between January of 2002 and 2005, today's NIV, as you can see, a major name change, was published. What's missing from the TNIV? Pretty much everything missing in the NIV is also missing in the TNIV. Check chapter 17 and see for yourself. It is also missing Jesus' name in those two verses, Matthew 17 verse 22 and Mark 14 verse 18, that every single text in the world that the NIV has. It's not really surprising, is it? It has perverted 242 of the 257 verses listed in this book for verses less than the NIV. Big, whopping difference. This number makes the TNIV the third worst Bible of the 40 reviewed for this book. This is our hall of shame so far, in terms of verses perverted from our sample. NIV 246 New International Version RSV 245 Revised Standard Version TNIV 242 Today's NIV NAS 238 New American Standard NRS 238 New Revised Standard NWT 237 Jehovah's Witness New World Translation as you can see from the numbers, the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses is in fifth place, behind these Protestant Bibles. Do you want a Bible that is worse than the one the Jehovah's Witnesses use? I don't. The New International Reader's Version, Neve. As you have seen already, in 1996 an early edition of the NIRV had been made inclusive language, but in mid-1997 the International Bible Society promised to rewrite it to conform to what they called NIV standards. In 1998 the revision was published, and people pretty much quieted down about the simplified Bible geared to children and people for whom English was a second or other language. What's missing from the NIRV? Because the NIRV is basically a simplified English Bible, it had to state things in simple sentences. 
So by accident, a lot of words that the NIV took out had to be put right back in the text where they belong. But even so, out of 40 Bibles, the NIRV still took 7th place, perverting 232 of our sample of 257 verses, just as many as the New American Standard 1995 update, NAU.115. The New International Version family of Bibles has endured its share of controversy. But that isn't what is important. We have to look behind the scenes at what is really happening. Satan got his way. People have already accepted the perverted Greek Bibles of Alexandria and the Greek and English texts of Westcott and Hort and rejected the words of God that God himself promised to preserve. It's amazing. More words, phrases, and verses are removed from the NIV than any other Bible, and yet people want their Bibles to be as conservative as the NIV. What an amazing con job. The Living Bible, LB. New Living Translation, NLT. 12. Error Paraphrased. More Good Intentions. With the same faulty foundation. Just like Lockman, Logsdon, and the New American Standard, the Living Bible was started out by a man with the greatest of intentions. Dr. Kenneth Taylor wanted a Bible that was easier to read than the King James Bible. So he set out to make a paraphrase for his kids. And what Bible did he make his foundation? The same one the New American Standard used, the American Standard 1901 ASV. Somewhere between his master's degree and his honorary doctorates, Ken Taylor said he was taught that the ASV was the most accurate of the word-for-word -word English translations and was prepared by a large committee of scholars far more expert in Greek than I was. So abandoning God's preserved words, he trusted some scholars who perverted or removed the historical text of the Bible in thousands of places. Let's face it, an easy-to-read lie is still a lie. He started with living letters in 1962, then eventually paraphrased the entire New Testament in 1967 and the Old Testament in 1971. So now people had Ken Taylor's paraphrase of Westcott and Hort's perverted Bible. After Billy Graham pushed the book into fame and fortune for Kenneth Taylor and his Tyndall House Publishing, Taylor decided to make a Roman Catholic edition, as well, to help along people trying to understand the Jesuit Douay Reims Bible. After a Roman Catholic priest translated the Apocrypha to his liking, Taylor had the Catholic Living Bible published and got both the Imprimatur and Nihil Obstat. 116, with those Catholic endorsements, the Catholic Living Bible also became a success. When I was studying Spanish in Cuernavaca, Morelos, Mexico in 1981, I saw plenty Spanish Catholic Living Bibles and Catholic Today's English Version, Good News, Bibles for Sale in local stores. I was amazed how all of a sudden I was seeing so many Protestant Bibles remade with an apocrypha for the Catholic people. Why not? There was big money to be made. Besides, there wasn't any real difference between the Protestant and Catholic Bible texts from 1979 onward. Both used Westcott and Hort's perverted Alexandrian type text. So what's the difference? What's missing from the Living Bible? The Living Bible is by nature a paraphrase, so lots of things Bible critics took out ended up right back in the text, just out of the need to make things clear. But out of our 257 chosen verses, the Living Bible clearly perverts 156 of them. In addition, there are still plenty of footnotes, each telling why this or that word or phrase does not belong in the text, but the text itself had the words. Still, 156 is an awful lot of verses with God's holy words removed, even if it is 61 less than the ERV and ASV. But the scholars changed all that with the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation In 1989, 90 evangelical scholars met to correct the Living Bible. But soon that aim was abandoned, and instead they worked to create a New Living Translation. They decided to use the Greek and Hebrew the Catholics and Protestants agreed upon, the United Bible Society's fourth revised Greek New Testament, 1993, and the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, 1977, both published at the Vatican and in Germany. Why not? As I said, they already agreed on the texts. 
All that was left was the translation and a few apocryphal books, of course. By 2004 the New Living Translation was released, at first almost silly in its gender neutrality. They had to keep revising the text, it seems, to keep ahead of the criticisms. Here are three versions of part of Acts 1 verse 21, from oldest to newest. So now we must choose someone else to take Judah's place. 2004. So now we must choose another man to take Judas's place. About 2006. So now we must choose a replacement for Judas from among the men. Second edition, current in 2009. The present edition is a lot less gender neutral, but does it contain more of God's words? What's missing from the New Living Translation? What started out to be a corrected living Bible quickly deleted enough words, phrases, and verses to make it tie for 11th place in our list of Bible perversions. In short, it deletes words in 225 of our selection of 257 verses, 8 more than Westcott and Hort got into the ERV and ASV. When it comes down to it, I don't want lies, whether accurately quoted or paraphrased. I just want to have in my hands the words that God said, that God himself promised to preserve. So I'll keep my King James Bible and pray to God for understanding, rather than trust these wise guy scholars to delete and reinterpret God's words for me according to their own whims. And you can paraphrase that any way you want. The Amplified Bible, AMP. 13. The Pick and Choose Bible. The verse that would not end. Have you ever heard the Amplified Bible read from the pulpit? The preacher has brought his Bibles and notes and is very excited to tell you what he has learned. You open your King James Bible and read the text. Romans 10 verse 4 for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. But the person behind the pulpit states in a scholarly tone to help you appreciate the depth of the nuances of these words, I want you to hear them again in the Amplified Bible. And this is what you hear. For Christ is the end of the law, the limit at which it ceases to be, for the law leads up to him who is the fulfillment of its types, and in him the purpose which it was designed to accomplish is fulfilled. That is, the purpose of the law is fulfilled in him as the means of righteousness, right relationship to God, for everyone who trusts in and adheres to and relies on him. Huh? This is supposed to be clearer than the simple words of the King James? Who are they kidding? They just blew up a 15-word verse to a whopping 75 words. And after all that, do you have a clue what it means? Try reading it out loud and see if that helps. But there is another result of reading the Amplified Bible that we don't notice so quickly. The reader that becomes the Bible translator. Suppose I were to come up to you and say, I was mad about the flat. If you were a 21st century American, you would interpret those words to mean I was mad, very upset, that my tire was no longer round. I would have to spend the next frustrating minutes of my life, or longer, getting tools out of my vehicle, jacking up my auto and removing the deflated tire, only to spend more wasted minutes, or longer, searching through the hot, scorching sun for a service station. However, if you were a 21st century British person, you would interpret those words to mean I was mad, thrilled, about the flat, apartment, I had just rented. Both of those meanings are equally valid, given the right circumstances. If I were in the scorching Arizona desert or in front of the Queen's Palace, you would know exactly which one was meant. The same is true in Bible study. Just because a word can mean different things in various circumstances does not mean that it must mean all of them, or any of them, in a certain Bible verse. We must look to the words and verses surrounding it, the context, to find out which meaning is correct. Bible believers through history have done this when they translated God's preserved words. But look at how the Amplified Bible refers to the Lord Jesus in John 1 verse 18. I put in bold type the words we are focusing on. No man has ever seen God at any time, the only unique Son, or the only begotten God, who is in the bosom, in the intimate presence, of the Father. He has declared Him, He has revealed Him and brought Him out where He can be seen, He has interpreted Him and He has made Him known. There are so many things wrong with this verse. Here are a few.
Sun is correct, but they put it in italics, meaning they don't believe it. Begotten is correct, but they put it with the wrong word, God. They have only supplied two possible readings, and both of them are wrong. The correct, historical and preserved words are, the only begotten son, but it's nowhere in the text, not in so much as a footnote. This translation forces you to become a Bible translator, a Greek and Hebrew scholar and theologian all rolled up in one, and choose for yourself which reading they provided that you think is correct. Is that what a Bible is supposed to do? No way! Those irritating italics. When I have read an amplified Bible out loud, I've never known quite what to do to make the italics obvious with my voice. Do I yell them, whisper them, or do I turn my head sort of sideways, or slant my hands, so people know I am reading italicized words? It's pretty clear that the Amplified Bible was made to be a reader's Bible, not a speaker's Bible. But oh, those italics hide a dark secret. Let's look at the introduction to a 1987 copy of the Amplified Bible, page 8. Italics point out. Certain familiar passages now recognized as not adequately supported by the original manuscripts. That is the primary use of italics in the New Testament, so that, upon encountering italics, the reader is alerted to a matter of textual readings. It doesn't matter how familiar the words are. If they don't belong in the Bible, we shouldn't put them there. Why would anyone do that? The answer is simple, marketability. Who will buy a Bible missing their favorite verses? Not many. They're not dumb. They want you to buy their Bible. So, to maintain their scholarly integrity and still make a profit, they put your favorite words that they do not believe in italics. But what about the passages that aren't so familiar? Aha! That's where they can delete words to their heart's content and hope you don't notice. Believe it or not, with the Amplified Bible, most people don't notice a thing. They still think the Amplified Bible is some kind of ramped up King James. But wait till they find out what's missing. What's missing from the Amplified Bible? When I first went through the Amplified Bible, I used an online version instead of one of my hardback Bibles. As I checked all 257 verses, I found 82 missing words, phrases, or whole verses. That's still important, because every single word of God is important, but it's 37th out of the 40 Bibles. But for some reason I had to look something up in a hardback amplified Bible, and suddenly the numbers rose dramatically. How? It turns out that the online version doesn't show any italics. So how many verses are perverted by the words, phrases, or whole verses being in italics? 112, and with 7, other ways they state that the words and verses do not belong, the total comes up to 201 out of 257 verses perverted in the Amplified Bible, only 16 less than Westcott and Hort's Bibles. That's 201 verses totally out of line with the preserved words of God, 78% of our sample verses. Brothers and sisters, that's no King James anything. Do we need a multiple choice Bible? As I read the Bible, there are many things I don't want to know. I don't want to read multiple choices of what God could have said. I don't want to read what men say God might mean. I don't want to read what men think God should have said. I just want to know what God said. And I trust His Holy Spirit to guide me into all truth. That is as amplified a Bible as I need. The Message Bible, MSG 14. A Counterfeit Message The Problem With Paraphrases You are sitting in Bible study and the leader asks you to read John 3 verse 5. You open your King James Bible and read, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. But the leader is not satisfied. He asks, Does anyone else have another translation? One person raises her hand and says, I have the Message Bible. The leader is intrigued. All sorts of famous people from all walks of life have been endorsing that version. Go ahead and read that to us. The leader says. So she reads. Jesus said, you're not listening. Let me say it again. 
Unless a person submits to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water creation, the invisible moving the visible, a baptism into a new life, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. An awkward silence. Eventually, the conversation starts again, and people continue to read, through John 3 verse 16. The study leader thinks, this is one of the most important verses in the Bible. I've got to hear how this verse is translated in the message. So the woman is asked to read again. You quickly recite in your mind the most familiar verse in the whole Bible. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then the woman opens her message Bible and reads, This is how much God loved the world, he gave his Son, his one and only Son, and this is why, so that no one need be destroyed, by believing in him anyone can have a whole and lasting life. The leader can take it no more. Are you sure that's what it says? May I see that? He reads the message for himself. That's exactly what it says. Quickly he teaches a lesson so everyone can understand what is wrong. 1. Jesus is God's only begotten Son. He is not God's one and only Son, because we are all God's adopted sons by faith in Jesus. 117. 2. The unsaved will not be destroyed. They will exist forever in the lake of fire. 118. 3. God is not promising a whole and lasting life in the present. He is promising everlasting life into eternity. Romans 5 verse 21, 6 23, and 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19 says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. That is the problem with paraphrases. The leader concludes, You find out what the author wants to say, but not what God actually said. Getting creative with the truth. We love to hear someone retell a story that he or she heard. It's fun to hear different people tell the same story, as well. Each person has some different nuance to share. Some are subtle, some hold you in suspense, and others make you laugh. But unless the story is very basic, most will leave out a detail here or there. That's normal. We expect that. But we can't have important details left out when we are dealing with God's words. God had a reason for every single word he put in his Bible. Want an example? Let me talk about a serious issue. There is a whole movement of people that wants to steal the hearts and take away the purity of your children. The lesbian slash gay slash bisexual slash transgender slash questioning LGBTQ movement is like an army that wants your kids in the worst way. 119. What do you do when your kids ask you to open the message Bible and answer that important question, what does God say about homosexuality? See for yourself. King James Bible, Romans 1 verse 27. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. The message Romans 1 verse 27. Sexually confused, they abused and defiled one another, women with women, men with men all lust, no love. And then they paid for it, oh, how they paid for it emptied of God and love, godless and loveless wretches. The words, the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another are absolutely clear. But the Message Bible simply talks about women with women, men with men abus, ing, and defil, ing, one another. Then it adds, all lust, no love. Any gay or lesbian couple who read that would say they are not abusing or defiling each other, because they love each other. The message may be poetic or tolerant, but it's not what God said. It won't help answer your child's question. What about 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 to 10 in the Message Bible? Guess what? Homosexuality is completely missing from those verses. And what about the carefully detailed list of sins God gave Paul in 1 Timothy 1 verses 9 to 10? Take a look, King James Bible 1 Timothy 1 verses 9 to 10. 
Nine knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. 10 For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. The message 1 Timothy 1 verses 9 to 10. 9 It's obvious, isn't it, that the law code isn't primarily for people who live responsibly, but for the irresponsible, who defy all authority, writing reshot over God, life, ten sex, truth, whatever. Wow! Can you believe it? A list of specific sins in the real Bible becomes whatever in the Message Bible. The most it says is writing reshot over, sex. A gay or lesbian, bisexual or transgender person could say, See? I don't ride reshot over sex I have a caring, committed relationship, so it's not about me. And we would have nothing to say. Again, if we search in the message for God's thoughts about homosexuality we come up empty. Brothers and sisters, when we teach Bible doctrine is not the time to get creative with the truth. Please understand what I am saying. There is nothing wrong with being creative, even with creative storytelling. It's wonderful in its place. But the Bible is the truth. Let's not change the truth of God into a lie, Romans 1 verse 25. It is no accident that the phrase, getting creative with the truth is a nice way of saying someone is telling a lie. Is the message a Bible? Some people say, why are you being so hard on the message? It's not even a Bible. Others say, the message is a paraphrase, not a translation. Still others go further, saying it's only a kind of preaching help, a homiletical tool. There are so many opinions. It's obvious that people are confused about how to classify the message. Let's see if Nav Press, the publisher, can clear this up. On the back cover of my hardback copy, it says, the message, Eugene Peterson's best-selling paraphrasing translation of the Bible. That's really confusing. Is it a paraphrase or a translation? It can't be both, can it? Let's look at the front cover, the Bible in contemporary language, the message, Eugene H. Peterson. It says the Bible. Can anyone deny it? But it also gives the name of Eugene Peterson as the author. Can man take credit as the author of God's words? Not according to my Bible. Let's open the message and look inside. The message is a contemporary rendering of the Bible from the original languages, crafted to present its tone, rhythm, events, and ideas in everyday language. From the original languages is what we say when we're making a translation. The copyright page says, thank you for purchasing a copy of the Message Bible. It's clearly called a Bible. And when you want to quote from the message text, it says you must use these words as follows colon. Scripture taken from the message. Copyright 1993, 1994, 1995, 1996, 2000, 2001, 2002. Used by permission of Nav Press Publishing Group. Do you see why people are so confused? In its own words, this book claims to be A paraphrasing translation of the Bible. The Bible in contemporary language. A contemporary rendering of the Bible from the original languages. The Message Bible. Scripture. Wow. It takes a lot of gall to call the message scripture. So-called scholars practically have a heart attack when we dare call the words of the King James Bible scripture. But they will call the message scripture? Unbelievable. You've seen the evidence for yourself. There is no doubt. They are selling the message as a Bible. So we will treat it like other Bible versions. What's missing from the message? As you have already seen, in some verses the message uses many more words than God did. But other verses are missing all sorts of important details. 
Using the list of verses from chapter 17, we can get a pretty good picture of what type of Greek text Peterson worked from. Out of 257 potentially perverted verses, the message is missing words and phrases in 208 of them, the same number as the Bible in basic English in God's Word to the Nations, and just nine less than Westcott and Hort's English ERV and American ASV Bibles. In short, the message is missing almost 81% of the words in our sample verses. That's not a paraphrase or translation. That's a perversion of the Bible. Could it be an accident? I wondered too. Look at Mark 1 verse 1, King James Bible. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The message. The good news of Jesus Christ, the message, begins here. Anyone knows the words, the Son of God, are incredibly important. Yet, the Son of God is missing from the message. The only two other English Bibles that even dared to remove the Son of God from Mark 1 verse 1 were the New World Translation, NWT, of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Today's New International Version, TNIV. But we can't generalize from just one verse. If you look at our list of 257 verses, you will see that, concerning the titles of the Lord Jesus Christ, the message is missing. Lord. In 11 verses frowny face 120, Jesus in 7 verses frowny face 121, Christ. In 28 verses frowny face 122, Jesus and Christ in 4 verses frowny face 123, both Lord and Christ in 4 verses frowny face 124, both Lord and Jesus in 2 Timothy 4 verse 1. Lord Jesus Christ in 6 verses frowny face 125, God. In Matthew 6 verse 33, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost in 1 John 5 verses 7 to 8. It's clear, it couldn't be a coincidence. It's not only missing the same words as other Alexandrian translations, it even removed titles for the Son of God that are found in every Greek text in the world including Alexandrian 126. As you will see from chapter 17, it's missing a lot of other important words, too, just like the other Alexandrian Bibles. And that is exactly what the message is, just another Alexandrian Bible. If you want to send people the right message, give them the King James Bible instead. They need the whole truth of God, not the creative paraphrases of man. Fifteen. The Bible that almost was. The Holman Christian Standard Bible, CSB. A third foundation. If you want to build a house, the first thing you have to think about is your foundation. If your foundation is lousy, the rest of the house will not matter. You can have the finest architects design it. You can use the most precious and expensive materials. You can decorate it any way you want. You can make it pretty or practical, in any style or shape you desire, but your house will never be any better than its foundation. Throughout this book I have been telling you about two foundations, God's words preserved through history by faithful believers starting in Antioch of Syria winked with Ephraim 127, and man's perverted words from Alexandria, Egypt by way of Rome, 128. But believe it or not, brothers and sisters, men have made up a third foundation. Have you ever witnessed to someone and given him the facts from reliable sources, including ones he himself trusts, and then he tries to squirm out of them? The fact is, he doesn't want to admit that he's wrong and you're right. That would mean that years of study or work or belief were all wrong. Nobody likes to feel like that. What does he do? He doesn't want to accept the truth as you gave it to him, but he sees plainly that his belief doesn't hold water either. So he invents a third way. Now he can leave his belief behind and still not accept yours. A few textual scholars did that same thing. They could see that the vast majority of manuscripts read like the King James. And it was plainly obvious that the Egyptian manuscripts were hopelessly corrupt you can't even find any two Alexandrian Bibles that agree with each other. But they didn't want to go all the way and accept the King James as God's preserved words in English either. What's a textual scholar to do? 
He's got years of work with manuscripts. And he doesn't want to feel they were all worthless. I'll tell you what he did. He came up with a third view that isn't completely preserved and isn't completely Alexandrian. How wishy-washy can you get, Charlie Brown? Their third text was named the Majority Text. It's a made-up name, obviously, but it's also a made-up text. It has never existed as a single volume any more than there's some single book called the Alexandrian Text lying around somewhere. It's just another theory by scholars about a book that never existed. The so-called Majority Text 129 this so-called majority text adds to or takes away from about a third as many words as various Alexandrian-type Greek texts do. But that is still over 1,000 places in the New Testament. Changing God's words is changing God's words, no matter how many times they do it. I don't want to face the fierce anger of Lord Jesus on Judgment Day with the lame excuse that I only took away from his words one-third as many times as the other guys. Ye shall not add to or take away from. He said, Some people tried to make their majority text fly anyway. In 1982, two men, Arthur Farstad and Zane Hodges, created a Greek New Testament according to the majority text. It's the Greek that's used in the NKJV Greek English Interlinear New Testament. And it's basically that M you see in the footnotes of a New King James New Testament. But the so-called majority text hadn't been translated into English. So in 1984, Arthur Farstad, who had been general editor for the New King James Version, got the idea to make an English New Testament based solely on his majority text. He got some help from another scholar friend, Edwin Blum, but the project never got finished. Jump ahead 14 years to 1998. Broadman and Holman, publishers for the Southern Baptists, were having a big problem. They needed a Bible to publish and use for scripture quotation, study Bibles, and other projects. They tried to buy the New American Standard, but twice the deal fell through. They thought about the NIV, but Zondervan, copyright holder to the NIV, and Broadman and Holman are rivals. Zondervan said they'd have to know about any of their rivals' projects as a condition to using the NIV. Forget that idea. Besides, this was about the time people started talking about a gender-neutral NIV 130 and that went over like a lead balloon. So both the NAS and NIV were out. Finally, Broadman and Holman decided they'd make their own Bible. They knew Arthur Farstad already had experience being a general editor, so they offered him the job. But Farstad wanted the New Testament based on his majority text. So they offered a compromise. They would pay for Farstad to finish his so-called majority text translation and give him a digital copy for his own use. In exchange, he would use instead the Alexandrian critical text for Holman's New Testament and let someone else handle the Old Testament. Farstad agreed. The Holman Christian Standard Bible was born. Then five months into the project, Farstad died, 131, and that was the end of the majority text in English. The Faulty Foundation for the CSB Edwin Blum, Farstad's friend, became the general editor, and the project went forward using the very newest critical Hebrew text for the Old Testament and newest critical Greek text for the New Testament. That became their foundation. Upon that foundation they built, using a 78-person team of the finest translators, linguists, stylists, and text-critical scholars. They used the latest research in textual criticism along with sophisticated computer technology. Like the NIV, the team came from 20 denominations, including Southern Baptists, Plymouth Brethren, Presbyterians, PCA, Congregationalists, Church of England, Church of God, Evangelical Free Church, Methodists, Evangelical Mennonites, and Episcopalians. 132. They decorated their version with twice as many textual notes, explanations, and special bullets to aid the reader. They designed their Bible to be more literal than the NIV and NLT, less literal than the NAS, NAU, and ESV, and less politically correct than the TNIV or NRS. 
They even finished off their version with the claim that it rejected both formal equivalence and dynamic equivalence in translation and used a third method, optimal equivalence of balance between the two, according to them. But you know what? None of that great sounding stuff really matters. The Holman Christian standard was built upon the faulty foundation of textual criticism, just like almost every other modern Bible version. Out of our 257 selected verses, the CSB is missing words, phrases, and whole verses in 234 of them, the same number as the ESV in Net Bibles, just three less than the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses and 17 more than Westcott and Hort's ERV and ASV. So in the end, there's not more than a few handfuls of difference between any of them. Faulty Foundation, Faulty Bible. Need I say more? What's missing from the Holman Christian Standard? Just to make it clear, the Holman CSB is missing 91% of the words, phrases, and verses listed in chapter 17. That puts it in a three-way tie for sixth worst, 133. Remember what I said about the CSB in chapter 4. In a few places in the NT, large square brackets indicate texts that the HCSB translation team and most biblical scholars today believe were not part of the original text. However, these texts have been retained in brackets in the HCSB because of their undeniable antiquity and their value for tradition and the history of NT interpretation in the church, 134. Just like the others, the CSB translators didn't believe those words, phrases, and whole verses, but they put them in their text so you would buy their Bible. How can this many scholars and writers, for so many Bible versions, be this disbelieving and dishonest? At least the disbelieving translators of the Revised Standard, Revised English Bible, Jerusalem Bible, New Jerusalem, and a few others didn't stoop to playing the italics and brackets games. They had the guts just to omit those words of God entirely. They didn't put them in the Bible with appeals to undeniable antiquity or value for tradition. It hurt their sales. But at least they were honest. The translators of the CSB used brackets on 46 of our 257 selected verses, meaning they disbelieved them but stuck them in their Bible anyway frowny face 135. Of the 45 whole verses marked as not belonging in the Bible in at least one version, see chapter 17, the CSB bracketed 40 of them and removed one, 91% of our list of removed verses. The CSB removed Acts 15 verse 34, notwithstanding it pleased Silas to abide there still, without any textual note whatsoever. The CSB completely removed at least one of the words that Christ spoke in no less than 53 verses frowny face 136. We don't need another Bible translation. We need to believe the one we have, that God preserved for us in the English language, the King James Bible. All these other Bibles, including the 40 analyzed in this book, add to or take away from God's holy words in hundreds, even thousands of places. Many of these words added or removed are very subtle. But these translators are violating God's command, whether they add or remove many or few. There is the old story of the well-off man who walked up to a pretty woman one evening. After a lot of small talk, he came to the point, Would you sleep with me for a million dollars? The woman thought for a minute, then said, Sure. The man, not missing a beat, pulled out a $10 bill and said, Let's go. The woman was both astonished and angry. She scowled, not on your life. What kind of woman do you think? I am? The man replied, I already know what kind of woman you are. We are just negotiating the price. When people, even well-meaning Bible translators, produce compromised Bibles, it does not matter how many words they added or took away. We already know what they are. The only difference is how many words of God they did it to. 16. How much scripture? Are we allowed to doubt? What if a person believed every single scripture of the Bible, except those few that say Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven? Let's say we came up with 10 verses that clearly state or imply that. There are 31,103 verses in the Bible. 10 out of 31,103 is only 0.03%, not a very high number. 
But think about the words of 2 John 1 verses 9 to 11. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. To transgress is to cross the line, to go too far. One Christian writer said abiding in the doctrine of Christ is like being on the very top of a mountain. One step back or one step forward, and you're not on the top anymore. You are either abiding in the doctrine of Christ or you are not. You either have God or you do not have God. It's that simple. You cannot play percentages with God's words. You either believe them all or you don't. You are either abiding in the doctrine of Christ or you are not. It doesn't say you have to understand them all. It means you have to believe them trust that God is true and he knows what he said. Our Christian life is based on faith, not on doubt. In 1983, while my future wife and I trained with the Summer Institute of Linguistics for Wycliffe Bible. Translators, I read a quotation from Martin Luther. It was so powerful that it has influenced my thinking to this day. If I profess with loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at the moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christ. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved, and to be steady on all the battlefield besides is merely flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. You cannot pick and choose which scriptures you will believe and which ones you will doubt. There is a battle going on, and at stake is the eternal destiny of every person on earth. They are either going to heaven to be forever with our heavenly Father, or they are going straight to hell and after a horrifying judgment to the lake of fire. Which Bible they read and what they believe makes all the difference in the world this one and the next. When they ask you which Bible, I pray you know exactly what to say without doubting. May God bless you as you make the right choice. Mm -hmm.